So the third type of symmetry that we often make use of, mostly because, again, it makes the problem simple, is spherical geometry. We did the cylindrical one, which works for cylinders and rods and lines. We did the plate, and now we're doing a sphere. This particular question, on top of showing you how to use Gauss's law in a spherical, symmetrical kind of geometry, it also introduced the fact that we have aluminum and copper, which are conductors. So as conductors, the charges will flow and respond to things around it, such that at equilibrium, the definition of equilibrium is that charges in conductors, they're not moving, even though they can move. So that must mean that inside the conductor, the electric field must be zero because it is at equilibrium. If you're not at equilibrium, this doesn't apply. Well, if you have charge continuing moving, then your electric field may not be zero. But if they are at equilibrium, they are all at rest. Everything is happy where they are. Inside the conductor, the electric field must be zero because contrary is that if there's an electric field there, the charges will move in response to that electric field. So as the conductors move towards equilibrium once you change the field, the charges inside will arrange themselves until the electric field inside is all zero. From this, then we can conclude that, so here's a conductor. If we take any part inside the conductor as a Gaussian surface, E is zero on every single point, then by Gauss's law, flux being that, oh, well, there's that, equals Q enclosed over epsilon naught. If E is zero, then flux is zero, then therefore Q enclosed must be zero. And this must be true for any surface I can draw inside the conductor. So that leads to another weird thing where we have, there can't be any excess charge inside a conductor when it's at equilibrium because Gauss's law states that if there's no electric field anywhere on the surface, then there's nothing, there's the, no possible charge that can be enclosed. So if they're not on the inside, where the heck are these charges? I mean, the sphere and the shell, they still hold a charge. Well then, that charge must be on the surface. And so Gauss's law can give us quantitative results like that as well, without being bogged down by too much of the math. And this is going to help us with dealing with questions of these types. So we'll take care of part A now. Part B, in the end, we'll kind of do it a little more qualitatively, just because of reasons that you'll see. For part A, though, we, have, we do have that spherical symmetry in the sense that we have an aluminum ball. It is, but we know that the charge here is 5 microcoulomb. And then we have... Uh, shell that goes from 6 cm to 8 cm and that's your copper with a charge of negative 8 microcoulombs and we want to find the electric field of all points in space I mean it seems like a big claim to do every single point but but having that spherical symmetry just means that we have to define the electric field for all R R being that axis because it should be the same no matter if you're on this part or this part as long as they're the same R it should have the exact same magnitude of the field anyways so there's various cases we have to take care of then let's start it from the center going outwards first case is when you have R is greater than zero, but less than four centimeters, which is our way of saying inside the AL sphere. At equilibrium, inside the sphere that's conductive, we have that. So that's really simple. So E must be zero for all those points, making it very, very simple. And then we keep moving. Once we move past here, we're going to have pretty much the same situation until we hit the outside shell. So that would be between four and six centimeters. That's basically between sphere and shell. 
So we want to point say here, then we will draw a Gaussian surface that has the same R all the way around as a sphere because of the spherical geometry. In 2D it looks like a circle, but really it's a sphere. In this sphere, we know that at every point, seeing how the inside has a positive charge, we know that the electric field goes away from it radially outwards. And that's a key word here, radially, because all radial lines will be parallel to the normal of the particular surface they're coming out of. These are all 9 degrees to the surface. Excellent. This is again a case where the magnitude of E is the same and that all your E's on the surface is parallel to your normal vector, which means that is true again. So then we use Gauss's law. We're going to integrate with that Gaussian surface is equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. Uh, key point here, this is only charge enclosed, so we don't care anything about whatever is outside of it. For this part of the question, it doesn't matter what's on the outside, all we care about what's on the inside. And that's another power of Gauss's law is to weed out a lot of this extra things that don't seem to matter. So in this case, the charge enclosed would be my 5 microcoulomb. We have the entire sphere inside us, and the dot product here is constant, so we just need the area of the sphere, area of the sphere, which is the surface area of the sphere being 4 pi r squared. So from that we can work out the electric field to be my 5 microcoulomb charge divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, which you might recognize is basically functioning just like our point charge. And then we keep moving outwards, which brings us to inside the copper shell. And because we're inside a conductor again, electric field is zero again. Then once we're outside of the shell, all the way out to infinity, it acts the same way. So we have the sphere again. To get the electric field at this particular point, so we draw a Gaussian surface of the same radius all the way around as a sphere. And again, because of the spherical geometry, this is going to be perpendicular to my surface or parallel to my normal. So my dot product just becomes that. Again, everything follows quite similar to before. It's just that we need the total charge enclosed now, which in this case, you have the 5 microcoulomb inside, but the 8 microcoulomb on the outside. You end up with negative 3 microcoulomb as a total because that's 5 plus minus 8. Putting it all together, following a very similar pattern as before, we get that where the negative signs mean inwards. And so writing it all pretty, we have 0 for r between 0 and 4 centimeter. Then we have 5 microcoulomb over 4 pi r squared epsilon naught when it's between my sphere and my shell. Then inside the shell we are back at zero again and then we go outside the shell and we ended up with negative three microcoulomb four pi r squared epsilon naught. These guys being defined in the radial direction radially outwards. And that defines E for all space. So that's part A. Part B we'll do kind of qualitatively because what they, we have here is well, we have a spherical shell, say on the outside, like that, center right there. But the sphere is offset by one centimeter. So, but here's the funny thing here. Because of this positive charge being off center, the charges that are in the shell will rearrange themselves to be a little more dense on this side than the other side because it's they want to be closer to the positive charge here and more than wants to be there. And so what makes this question difficult is that we no longer have spherical symmetry, which then of course makes our integral for the flux quite a bit more difficult. And so we may have to actually take that integral perhaps numerically to get proper answers. We could however talk about most 
of the things because there's some areas that we can still talk about uh easy things like when you're inside the sphere or inside the shell you get e equals zero so that covers that part and all these parts so that's some of the space and another part is if we go outside the shell because the charges on the inner surface arranges themselves to cancel out the off-centeredness the outside surface actually is still going to have a very balanced spherical symmetric distribution of charges on the outside so then the electric field is just like before centered at the center of the sphere so same as before so then the only kind of difficult part is what the heck happens between the sphere and the shell and we're just going to leave it at kind of qualitative discussion you can sketch out that more of the field will end up coming to this side and then there'll be less field coming out that way to find out the magnitude at any particular point is not as obvious because even if we try to do a spherical a spherical Gaussian surface around the center of just the sphere you will see that the electric field along the different points is no longer the same so this integral again becomes difficult to take so even though Gauss's law has its limitation in dealing with cases where it lacks symmetry you can still see that based on the results we got using Gauss's law we can still inform ourselves of most of the things that's going on even this complicated looking situation we can still qualitatively come up with all parts of space except for just this little part in between the sphere and the shell just to stress that in learning physics is important to both be able to evaluate and do the math but also to have a qualitative understanding and interpretation of what those math is trying to tell you